but it's the word old, O-L-D. And I, and I urge people, when you leave here today, if you remember nothing, remember the word old. And by December of 2020, I had 1.3 million people in an email chain. Entertainment is in my blood. It is who I am. It is what I do. Welcome to the Theatre Art Life podcast and hello. We're putting the spotlight on those who create live entertainment around the globe, the culture creators and the backstage masters. My name is Anna Roth. Welcome to our LDI special. In our LDI series, we'll be speaking to some of the people who'll be speaking or exhibiting at this year's LDI show running from November 14 to 20 at the Las Vegas Convention Centre. Today, our guest is Michael T. Strickland. Michael started Bandit Lights in 1968. The company grew into a global leader. Along the way, he founded and owned Thomas Engineering US, Tomcat Engineering US, Averlights US, Best Techs, Gear Park, Authentic Stars, Vol Air, BPH and GRN Light. He also acquired Lights Up, Meteor Lights and DPH Lighting, as well as having an interest in Skycam. Strickland and others started We Make Events, Red Start Alert and Covey during the COVID pandemic. Strickland won many prestigious awards over the years, including CNN, USA Today, Entrepreneur of the Year, and was the only second non-musician to win the Academy Country Music ACM Milestone Award. In 2022, Strickland was presented the rarely given CMA Humanitarian Award. Strickland has won numerous industry awards, including the Parnelli Visionary Lifetime Achievement Award, the Polestar Impact 50 Award, the Polestar Heroes of Live Award, and he's in numerous halls of fame. The University of Tennessee named him Distinguished Alumni of both the College of Business and the and of the entire University of Tennessee. Bandit Lights has been named Lighting Company of the Year in the industry leading 27 times. From 2020 up to today, Strickland has been a fierce advocate for the entire entertainment industry before Congress, the media and the industry. Strickland was key to passage of the CARES Act, PPP, P2, Enhanced Unemployment, Save Our Stages, and is now working on PASIC, the Music Act, and the formation of the Entertainment Association. Strickland has appeared nonstop on network television and testified before Senate on behalf of the industry. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Anna. I'm honoured to be here, and thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Well, that's wonderful. It's an honour to have you, and you're such an advocate for the industry. And I want to grow you about this, but first... I'd like to know a little bit about you. And I read that you started working at 12 with the Beach Boys. Uh, I want to, I want, please explain. <laughs> That's an early time to start a career. <laughs> I wish I could say it was hard. And, and, and I wish I could say I did something amazing. That in 1968, it was as simple as uh, they built a new high school gym in my hometown of Kingsport, Tennessee. And in 1968, we had two very unusual things. First being air conditioning and the second being a 12,000-seat building with no sightline obstructions. Because of that, this, this very small backwater town in East Tennessee began to get the monkey, the Beach Boys, Par, Beer, and the Raiders, the Day Park Five, Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons, all the pop stars of the day. And you have to trail back it for those people that are not old enough. In 1968, the artists all played with the ceiling lights on. If you see the old movies of the Beatles in the baseball stadiums, they're playing with the stadium lights on. So lighting from theater was just beginning to move to rock and roll at that point in time. And I'd been in theater as a child, so I knew that it existed. And I wanted worse than anything to be in the music business, but God gave me no talent. I, I tried to play every instrument. I tried every <laughs> possible path and, and indeed was kicked out of two choirs for, for having such poor voice. So when I went and saw a rock show in this new uh, high school gym, I knew I could take the lights from the high school theater down to the gym and light the rock shows. Because at that time, a few people were doing it in New York and a few people were doing it out in L.A. And it was the psychedelic era, you know, with all of the, the oil and water projections behind the stage. So I was just this kid that took these lights with my buddies and, and put them around the stage. And each of those bands came through and they had not really experienced that. So they asked if we could go to the next city, which was, I, I don't know where, I don't remember who knew this would be a career. But, uh, you know, the first time I was asked because I was 12, I couldn't do it because I couldn't drive. But the next, <laughs> you know, two or three weeks later, we had another pop show and I had a gentleman with a car and a U-Haul trailer. And the question was asked again, 
and indeed we went to the next city. And that was how Bandit Lights was born. So, you know, it was really easy because we were doing something in the southeast that no one else was doing. Now it was happening in the northeast and on the west coast. And we began to hear about one another. But that was that was how it began. And, and uh, my senior year in high school, we, we grossed two hundred thousand dollars. And uh, we had all the business with the pop stars of the day. Uh, it's sort of in the Southeast because you know, at that point, again, the national and the international touring market had not yet been born. And mm-hmm. that, was, that was really how it happened. That's really interesting. And when you finished uh, school, then you went to the Haslam College of Business. Is that right? Correct. When I finished high school, I went to the University of Tennessee College of Business and I uh, got a business degree and then a law degree, but continued the company while I was there because I'm always a fierce advocate of education, always been a fierce advocate of education, still am. And uh, you know, I knew that if the show business thing didn't work out, I could fall back on my, on my business and or my law degree. And uh, I, I was on tour the whole time I was in college. And, and when I was in law school, I was uh, Kenny Rogers' production manager. And at that point in time, Kenny Rogers was the biggest act in the world. And uh, mm-hmm. so when I got out of law school, there was never a question about what I was going to do. I just continued. <laughs> so did you think that, did you take the business thing as, a, you said that you kind of took it as a backup. So did you see that as a separate, like, career path from what you were actually doing in, you know, in the lighting industry? Or did you see that that was going to combine to be the future of your career? Yeah, no, it was a necessary part of my career because, you know, I knew that I needed to understand business and, and equally important, I knew I needed to understand law because, as we know, contracts and, and all of these legal issues arise in all facets of all businesses. So when I emerged from law school, I, I had, you know, I had a very good background in business and in law to help me understand what I was doing. And at that time, again, for those people that, that were there in the late 60s, early 70s, most everybody, and in, in, I, I use the word rock and roll to encompass all kinds of live touring, uh, most people in rock and roll uh, had no formal education and were there for all the wrong reasons, which trails back to the old expression, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, uh, mm. which is why most people were there. And indeed, most people that I knew from back then are either uh, dead, out of the business, retired, uh, you know, gone in one way or another. It, it really wasn't uh, sort of until the late 90s, early 2000s that uh, you began to see uh, college educated folks come into the industry and then indeed venture capitalists come into the industry. And yeah, now a lot of the industry is controlled by people with sort of business degrees and such. Mm. Is that what, would you encourage people who are getting into the industry to get some studies in business? Because I do think that some people, they don't necessarily have that. And and, and when you come into the business, if you're freelance or whatever, you're actually technically your own business, right? So even even some basic business, uh, business basics will be helpful for your career if you know how to manage yourself. Correct. And I will say to the credit of the industry and to the credit of the people in the industry and, and and, and indeed, my dealings, our dealings here at Bandit Lights now are much wider than just rock and roll touring. Uh, we have an integration division that, that we sell lights into, into venues. And we work in film, television, theater. The entire industry has grown and changed. And you know, let's go back to 1978. If you were on a tour bus, uh, there was drugs, alcohol, and people watching porn on the television. Uh, go to the tour bus today, uh, there's no drugs, very little alcohol, and people with laptops, uh, you know, looking at stocks or reading something. So today's uh, gals and guys that are that are working within the industry are a step above, a big step above those of us in the 60s and 70s. A lot of them, oddly enough, do have college degrees, do have advanced education. Typically, it's in theater. Typically, it's in something to do with entertainment. Typically, it's not in, in the business realm. But, mm. but today's set of, of, of gals and guys that drive this wonderful business forward are indeed much more educated, much more focused, and much more in tune with you know, the business of the industry as opposed to those of us in the 60s and 70s. 
Yeah, that's really interesting when you look at it from that perspective. Um, you got to look at it from, from the past to the future to see how much it's changed. We, we tend to focus just what we see in front of us sometimes. If somebody wanted to start a company, which you've done obviously many times in this industry, what, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to start a company? Uh, I speak quite a lot to a number of groups. I'm an adjunct professor at the university. And I have the same advice really for all young folks because I believe it cuts across across all platforms, not just the entertainment field. But it's the word old, O-L-D. And I, and I urge people, when you leave here today, if you remember nothing, remember the word old. Here's what old means to me. Anyone that's successful has three things, opportunity, luck, and dedication. Opportunities will come your way in life. Uh, luck controls a lot of that. Now, a lot of people argue with me about that, but when I di digress and, and dissect their lives, indeed, they realize, yeah, there was a lot of luck in that, you know, being in the right place at the right time and meeting the right person. But the final piece and probably the biggest piece and the one that you have most control over is dedication. If you believe in yourself, if you believe in what you're doing, if you believe that you have the talent and the ability to succeed and you don't give up, you will succeed. There's an old expression that's most often uh, accredited to uh, uh, Henry Ford. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Uh, and I'm a firm believer in that because for those people that get up in the morning and say to themselves, well, I can never do that today, they've just set their course. They are not going to achieve that today. But for those people like myself that get up in the morning and say, you know, today I'm going to make a difference. Today I'm going to achieve this and such. Those people are more likely to succeed than not. And, you know, those three things, opportunity, luck, and, and dedication. Look for the opportunities. Realize it takes a lot of luck to bring some of them your way. But if you believe in yourself, never give up. Mm, wonderful advice. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that old uh acronym as well so um you've also won numerous awards what award that you've won means the most to you and why geez <laughs> <laughs> uh, i've never been asked that question <laughs> that's an interesting question uh none of the awards that that i won are, are the type of things that you apply for uh mm -hmm. they're you know they just kind of come at you and Probably the most surprising was last uh, summer in 21 when the Academy of Country Music called me and told me I was uh, uh, being awarded with the, uh, the Academy of the ACM Academy of Country Music Award for my legislative effort. And then right up there with it was a month ago again, uh, the Country Music Association, the CMA, uh, called and, and, and are doing the same thing. And in fact, it's actually going to be on television. Uh, November 9th in what, 10 days time, I suppose, two weeks time. Both those were completely out of the blue uh, because you're being recognized by you know, your peers. Uh, right up there with that, I think, would be the, the pole star heroes of live. Uh, that was coming out of COVID and, and all of the managers and agents and artists were the people that, that decide on that one. And, and that's not an award that ever existed. They created that award. Uh, mm. and, and, and honored me because of my legislative efforts. I spent two and a half years uh, you know, working legislatively for the entire industry. And this goes from Broadway to the Spring Actors Guild to the Directors Guild to the Theater Guild to uh, television to film to sports to rodeos to fairs. I mean, it's, that's I'm working toward representing anyone that needs a live audience in front of Congress. And uh, it, it sort of became a passion because I noticed very early in the pandemic, uh, no one else had the training or the ability to do it, and seemingly no one else had the desire to do it. So it's it's become a mission. Mm. And what is it that you bring before Congress when you, when you're taking them there in, in terms of that advocacy? You know, it, it all began. The pandemic shut the world down in the United States on uh, Friday, uh, March thirteenth, twenty twenty. That night, I called my two senators, Marsha Blackburn and at the time, Lamar Alexander, and said, help. They immediately began helping. And Sunday morning, I called Lamar Alexander 
and uh, he was with the Secretary of the Treasury, Stephen Mnuchin, and he put his cell phone on uh, speaker. And uh, I got to explain the state of our industry to Stephen Mnuchin. And he thought, well, you've got contracts, you're going to get paid. And I explained to him that it wasn't quite how entertainment worked. And uh, he said, what a stupid business. And as we moved <laughs> forward, as we moved forward, and I'll give you the short version, two unique things happened, and this is the impetus of why we need to do this entertainment association. First and foremost, uh, virtually everyone, whether it's the general public or whether it's the political leaders, and this is a global phenom phenomenon, they believe that we all work for really wealthy entertainers. Whatever field it's in, whether it's on Broadway, theater, rock and roll, the rodeo, what, whatever field one may work in, they believe that we work for extraordinary wealthy people, and those people should take care of us. Uh, and of course, we, we all know that most of us are contract laborers, and even those people that, that do work for a venue or for a, a, a theater company or whatever they may work for, uh, they all got laid off, and this was a global phenomenon. So the, the, the first thing that you battle is the fact that there's just this overarching belief that we work for really wealthy people and they should take care of us. The second thing is, and again, a global phenomenon, uh, but I can speak to it in the U.S., uh, we as an industry have no voice before any political body anywhere in the world, and here's why. Uh, from the beginning of time, entertainment does really well. When times are bad, entertainment does better. Vaudeville was born in the Great Depression. When, for some odd reason, when times are bad, people will spend money to entertain themselves. We've never been able to explain it. But even now, with, with the world you know, being in a recession and inflation and all of those things, while a lot of things are depressed, a lot of prices are, are, are inflated, people are spending money on $6 Starbucks coffee, they're spending money on the expensive cookies and pastries, and they're going to see all forms of entertainment. And this flies in the face of the fact that there are tough economic times. So we never knew that we could be affected by a negative economic situation, and then suddenly, boom, a pandemic hits and we're shut down. There were two industries that were shut down totally for 16 months, all things live entertainment and cruise lines. Cruise lines are composed of six, eight huge companies that were never going to get any kind of an assistance from any government anywhere, so they turned to the Saudis. All of the cruise lines got money from the Saudis, and that's how they weathered the storms. Entertainment is, is, is a collection of gypsies, basically. It, it, it is a, a, you know, globally, there are thousands of different companies, large and small, that make up entertainment. And we are so vertically integrated that the show will not go on tonight if the chain below is broken. But we, we do not have a single voice. And what happened in America and around the world, because I ended up talking to We Make Events and being involved with We Make Events, in Europe, I helped set up We Make Events in America, and I ended up talking to people in Asia, in Australia, and New Zealand, and it was the same story everywhere. Going before the legislative body, in the case of America, Congress, you have no voice. When you go before the legislative bodies around the world, the airlines go as one, uh, the restaurants go as one, the pharmaceutical companies go as one, most of your big industries go as one. They go in what I call a battleship. They have power. We went in 10,000 canoes because what ended up happening globally was the theater people went arguing for themselves. The fair people went. The promoters went. The, 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 you know, every discipline went alone. And you ended up being in 10,000 canoes. We have got to, here in the United States, build the Entertainment Association so we can all come together if there's ever a potential shutdown and speak with one voice. Because what I heard from start to finish from the legislators around the world is you don't have a unified voice. Mm. 
Well, that's, I mean, that, in, that explanation has really provided a lot of clarity for me because, you know, I'm on the other side of the world. So it's really interesting to hear uh, hear that. And, yeah, like we experienced it everywhere as well. And And so the Entertainment Association will bring all of those sort of entertainment genres I guess together that's the idea and then um and that and there's a bit a committee that how does that work how does an association work for those who are ignorant to uh to this sort of process great question and and right now this is just the beginning of it I give my first public speech uh November 1st in Nashville at a at a convention Uh, I then go to LDI in Las Vegas and uh, and speak I then go to Lidditz Pennsylvania to another convention and speak, and then going into 2023, I've got five other m- moments at which I speak to huge crowds. At the same time, uh, I'm, I'm speaking to the NFL, National Football League, uh, the National Basketball Association, Major League Baseball, the Broadway League, you know, sort of all the sports leagues. Uh, those are a lot easier. Why? Because they have a commissioner, they have a league. And if you get Roger Goodell to agree, then you've got the NFL on board. Uh, you, you're going to need a uh, Live Nation, AEG, William Morris, CAA, all the other booking agencies. You're going to need uh, the the International Association of Venue Managers. Uh, you're going to need Screen Actors Guild, Directors Guild, Produ- Producers Guild. Uh, I mean, it's on and on and on. International Association of Fairs and Expositions. You, you know, let, let your mind run wild. All of the organizations that do exist and do lobby for their particular needs. They need to stay. They need to remain. They need to continue to fight the fights they fight on a daily basis for what it is they need. But if we face a moment like this again, we must lay those organizations aside and approach the government as one uh, and have that single voice. And right now, there are five potential situations, at least in the United States, that could again uh, create a shutdown. There could be another pandemic. There can be social unrest. There can be war. Uh, there can be something that no one sees, or there can be an economic calamity. Any one of those things uh, lay before us. And in my two and a half years before Congress, there are people focusing on all of those right now and, and already saying that, well, if, and in your case, this is very uh, germane, if China invades Taiwan, we need to shut down all public gatherings in the United States because of potential danger factor. If that comes to fruition, we would be right back where we were in 2020. What's different between 2022 and 2020? In 2022, around the world, not just in the United States, no government knew how to shut the country down, but more importantly, they didn't know if they could, politically, socially, and every other way, they all now know the answer to both those questions. Yes, we can, and here's how we do it. That's really interesting. Do you think that because of the last five years that the industry is more volatile and having, you know, you've been in the industry a long time, when you look across that sort of path, what is your reflection on the volatility now compared to sort of 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago in terms of it being a secure industry, aside from COVID. There's there's a lot of political factors. There's, you know, um, there's a lot of things going on in the world and I feel like there is a little bit of uncertainty. You know, we've got uncertainty here in Hong Kong with what's happening politically. There's a lot of uncertainty in the UK um, with <laughs> rotating prime ministers. There's, you know, uh, the US has got this stuff and then there's, you know, cr- cross-political stuff across the country. Do you think that's affecting the industry itself in what what's getting put out and what's being toured and, and what's being performed? The the divisions that the divisions that we all see across the world uh, politically, you know, the world's become a much more divided place. And and that has affected those of us as we know within the entertainment industry. Uh, I have always believed that if I were an entertainment person, be it film, video, TV, music, or whatever, I would keep my politics to myself because once you take a side and once you go public with it, you alienate some portion of your audience. And, uh, you know, a, a great number of artists have gone out on a limb and, and stood for some particular cause and then, and then 
upset a large set of people that, that stop going to their shows or stop seeing their performances or stop buying their music or whatever. I'm not sure that I see the wisdom in that. Having said that, I've spoken to a number of them and, you know, they feel like they have a big platform and they need to use it because they're committed to, to whatever the cause may be. So you know, it sort of begins there. But to answer your question, yes, I think post pandemic, uh, the polarization is uh, much larger than it was pre pandemic. I think that uh, uh, many people now feel much more comfortable in voicing his or her opinion. And it, it has indeed uh, uh, created within our own industry uh, a, a divisiveness. And again, you can look at the, 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 current, the current situation with Kanye West uh, mm -hmm. without judging his, his uh, statements and his most recent anti-Semitic statement. And I think clearly it, it, his tweet or whatever it was was by all accounts anti-Semitic. But you can see the division it has caused. Whether it should or shouldn't have is you know, not the topic. And what I'm talking about, it's the fact that it did. You know, that's happening a lot more now than it ever did. But getting back to, the, to where I started this, do I think that negatively impacts the industry per se? No, because right now the industry is really, really busy. Now, there was one confusing thing that happened, and that is, all forms of entertainment started in full in earnest in January of 2022. So we had a very crowded space globally. Everybody mm. thought, well, the world's been shut down, so I'm going to put my show on or my dance troupe or my Broadway play or my rock show or, or my theater production or whatever it might have been. So everybody went out, and I liken it to the Indianapolis 500 and all the race cars at the Indianapolis 500 are on the starting line together, side by side. It would be very confusing. <laughs> I think January of 2023, there's going to be staggered starts again. And one of the byproducts of all of this, and again, uh, I, I mean nothing political by this, but I, I do believe it to be true. When everything, all of these shows began being put on and all of these events happened, uh, one thing that has, has taken hold in the world is this uh, diversity and, and equity and inclusion. Well, the media has shifted to uh, promoting a tremendous number of very diverse uh, entertainment offerings and, and, and a lot of, of, of very unique, uh, diverse entertainment offerings that you may have never heard of were sort of thrust to the forefront of the media. And, and what happened was, you know, acts or shows or productions that technically didn't you know, sell a lot of tickets or sell a lot of records or or, or, or didn't actually generate a lot of income, were suddenly all over the media. So the people, the productions, the shows kind of bought into the to the press, and then they said, "Well, we're going to go on tour, or, or we're going to we're going to mount a big production in this theater, or you know, we're going to do whatever we're going to do, but we're going to do it in a grandiose scale." So a lot of shows went out this year in a grandiose scale, and sold no tickets, and sold no records, and sold no music, and those, for the most part, are the ones that in the last six months we have seen uh, closing and tours mm. holding because, you know, th there's a set of things that make Cirque du Soleil. It always makes money. Most things on Broadway or West End always make money. Uh, the Weekend makes money. The U2, the Rolling Stones, I mean, you, you know who they are. Mm. But, but a whole lot of these uh, sort of niche entertainment things got a ton of publicity, believed the publicity, and went out and mounted these big productions, and those things have collapsed and or folded. I think that will be flushed out by January, February, and I think that, that we will be back to a staggered start and a more sensible situation where the, the world will not be struggling as bad as it did for people, for trucks, for buses, for equipment. For supplies, you know, for all of the things that we need that have been crippling for the last few months. And, and I think we're, we're going to return to normalcy simply because we're going to have a more normal delivery system. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, it's been very fascinating to see supply chains and every, everywhere around the world just totally affect timelines. And that's personally in, in my work as well. It's like constantly moving the dates down and down and down. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a global issue right now. So that's good that you predict it to be better by early next year. I think that that, that would be reassuring for a lot of businesses. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're already, I didn't believe that the people crisis would uh, begin to correct until the end of March 2023, but we are already seeing uh, in the United States and indeed in Europe, I, I can't speak to Asia, but in those two markets, uh, about 10 days ago, we began to see easing. Mm. Uh, and, and that's good because it's, it's, you know, it's three months ahead of, of when most of us thought the easing would begin. Mm. Mm. So you're speaking at LDI this year, as you uh, as you referenced uh, earlier, and, and are you going to be speaking about the Enter- Entertainment Association? I, I believe you're on a panel, right? So can you tell us what you're talking about there? Y- yes, ma'am. That's that's 100% what the panel is about is 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 getting people to understand the need to come together as one to prevent a future calamity where that we do have a voice, but it's in the United States uh, before Congress. That, that's that's the whole message. Uh, mm. because, you know, 10 months into the pandemic, uh, and I, I left this out, but because of my legislative work, I started doing a small email chain to f- sort of to friends in the industry. And by December of 2020, I had 1.3 million people in an email chain. And uh, I would email four or five times a week with, with, not with opinions, but with facts and figures and messages from political leaders. I've met over 100 senators. Uh, and representatives. So I was sort of the fact man. And uh, I also serve on the board of the University of Tennessee Medical Center and uh, spent a great deal of time dealing with the pandemic. was one of the first people in the world to, to get the vaccination because of my role at the hospital. So I, I brought a, a political element. I brought a medical element. And of course, I brought the show business element. And, and I put this email out Still do. It's it's now once every two or three weeks, but uh, at, at any rate, uh, this this big chain of people became very dependent on me. And indeed, I helped tens of thousands of people uh, get funding, and I explained laws to them and things of that nature, uh, and have made a lot of good friends. But back, you know, ten months into it, everyone understood we need an organization. Everyone. I mean, there there was a lot of conversation about that. Here we are, you know, two and a half years in. A lot of those people have said, "Ah, why do we need an organization? This will never happen again. What do I say to those people? I I look them in the eye and say, Susan, Bob, did you see the pandemic coming? Did you know we were going to be shut down? Well, no. And I said, well, then why would you believe this will never happen again? And, And that's kind of where I start these conversations. Mm, mm. Oh, much needed leader in our time, but in, in our industry. So that's amazing the work that you do. Uh, we always finish our podcast by asking two questions. So I'm going to ask you these two questions. I think you're going to have answered one. But the first one is, um, what do you like most about your job or the industry? First and foremost, uh, entertainment is in my blood. It is who I am. It is what I do. Uh, people that work closely with me, uh, will tell you I've had five failed personal relationships. Uh, I'm married to, to the business and to the industry. Uh, so when you're wired that way, obviously you enjoy it. And, and what I enjoy about it is the people, the challenge, uh, the opportunity, and the ability to make not only the industry better and leave it better than we found it, but also to enrich the lives of all of the people you come into contact with so that each individual and their families at the end of it all have, have, have gained from what it is that, that, that I do, that we do, that, that you all do. I'm not just here for a paycheck. I'm not just here to, to, to be in the entertainment business. I'm here to make a difference. And by the grace of God, I've been allowed to do that. And The last two and a half years, and this is going to sound weird, have probably been the best two and a half years of my life because I've been able to help so many people. Uh, And, and, you know, I I wondered a long time ago, 
I'm involved in politics and have been for 30 years. I, I, I ran the local chamber of commerce. I lobby for the University of Tennessee. So I've got this big political piece. I've got this big medical piece. Uh, I've got this obviously big entertainment piece. And I often wonder, what am I going to do with these three things? They have nothing to do with one another. And then the pandemic hit and they all came together. So, you know, in my mind, God was preparing me for, for uh, March 13th, 2020. And it's been a blast ever since helping people. And that's an amazing answer, an amazing answer to that question. Thank you. The last one is, and I think you're going to say the Entertainment Association, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you could change one thing about your job or the industry, what would it be? Well, the easy answer is to, to, to establish uh, the Entertainment Association here in the United States, and indeed something like that globally because uh, everybody needs one. But let me go to a let me go to a more pressing uh, conversation that has been on the forefront of my mind since 1973. Uh, the the sad part about all of entertainment is it is a collection of freelancers, and you know when times are good, I think the freelancers themselves enjoy that and wish it to be that way but I witnessed firsthand globally during the pandemic uh, great regret from freelancers because they had no health insurance they had no retirement scheme they had no uh, employer to take care of them uh, and in many cases in many countries their ability to go gain any kind of uh, public support was greatly limited because they had chosen to work as a freelancer. Now, over time, in most countries, the governments came to understand that, okay, we need to step outside the box and help the freelancers. But uh, our industry uh, sort of eats its own, and, and you take a young guy or gal and you put them in a production, and you know, from 19 to 35, 40, 42, everything's wonderful, and not unlike a professional athlete, when they get to the tail end of the career, most of them haven't been fiscally responsible and they can't afford to retire, but they can't really do much of anything else because they've been in the entertainment industry so long. Mm -hmm. If we could change that, if we could do like the sports leagues have and, and, and create you know, something that takes care of all of the great gals and guys that make up this wonderful industry, that would be amazing. Oh, that's also a wonderful answer and uh, very true, very true. Look, Michael, this has been an inspiration to speak with you today. I really appreciate it. And I am going to come find you at LDI when you're doing your uh, panel talk so I can introduce myself to you in person because <laughs> I'll be there. Thank you so much for your time with Theatre Art Live podcast today. I really appreciate it. Thank you and have a great day. Theatre Art Live is a global media site for entertainment. Memberships start at only $38 US per year. You can have unlimited access to our daily published articles, including entertainment news and the writings of active industry professionals, ensuring that you are always up to date on the global happenings in the world of entertainment. Become a part of the international entertainment community and join us now at www.theaterartlife.com.